You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dodge Movie Podcast. We are kicking off Pride Month with episode 68. We are going to be talking about the 2011 film Cloudburst. I had never heard of this film, and so we were looking for some high-quality romantic comedies to go along with our theme this month, and Cloudburst looked like a fun one, so we watched it, and we're going to tell you what we thought about it. But first, I'm going to tell you about the director, Tom Fitzgerald. It stars Olympia Dukakis, Brenda Fricker, Kristen Booth, Molly, or excuse me, Michael McPhee, Kristen Booth plays Molly, Mary Colin Chisholm, Stephen Arnold, and Juanita Purse. Peters, sorry, Juanita Peters. The writer was also Tom Fitzgerald. And the synopsis for this film, thanks to IMDb, is a lesbian couple escapes from their nursing home and head up to Canada to get married. Along the way, they pick up a young hitchhike, a young male hitchhiker. This film had no taglines, and for a little bit of trivia, it very much reminded me of a Netflix documentary called A Secret Love that I highly recommend. It is fabulous. It's the, a little bit of a twist is the in the documentary, the lesbian couple, one of them has well, it's, that's why it's so similar to this. It has like a niece, I believe. It's a niece and not a daughter who is concerned that her mother and her mother's partner, she knows they're gay and she's fine with it, but she's worried about them living alone and being able to take care of one another. And so she really wants to move them into an, like an assisted living or a older folks home. So it really reminded me of it. This one has a quite a bit more comedy than the other one. The other one is so sweet and it's like just a beautiful love story. So in this month of Pride, if you have not seen A Secret Love on Netflix, I highly recommend it. One thing from the director that I want to add before I kick off Mike and his pickup line is I ran across a quote that he had and I thought it was beautiful and it kind of explains why he wanted to make this movie. And it's, I came out in the 1980s when HIV was something everyone was dealing with. And I remember it was the lesbians who really came out and supported people and took care of people. They stepped in and they got things done. I think that's the kind of hero I wanted to see on the big screen. We never get to see protagonists like that. This is his word, not mine. <laughs> I think an old dyke is the perfect romantic heroine. <laughs> so Yeah, hmm. uh, maybe he got a pass for that one. Yeah, I, I hope I did too. All right, Mike, kick us off with the pickup line of this movie, Cloudburst. They had tequila again, finally. And what's going on in this scene when that is spoken? Well, we are introduced to Stella coming into the house with her bottle of tequila. And we see her interacting with Dot. And fairly early on, even if we hadn't read the synopsis of the film, we can see that they're in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And is it right after that that, Olymp uh, that Stella, Stella is Olympia Dukakis' character? And Brenda Fricker, who we remember from So I Married an Axe Murderer, she played Mike Myers' mother. She takes her outside. Is that right after the scene that you're talking about? Or does that happen? I thought it, I thought it happened pretty early. Yeah, I thought per, perhaps she does. But fairly early on, they have an incident which probably goes in the couldn't be made today category where she playfully assaults the poor blind woman with a back well, massager. You stepped on it. What I was going to say. Ah, okay, cut that out, Jeff. <laughs> what I was going to say was, I thought it was a beautiful way for, you know, we talk a lot about show, don't tell. And she leads Dot outside, but it just looks like, you know, a couple holding hands, going outside to admire the, right. the sunset. And she's describing the sunset to her. And at first I just thought she was commenting on it. Right. But yes. then uh, suddenly you realize, oh, Dot is blind and she's describing it to her so that she can enjoy it, too. And I just thought such a also a beautiful way to show that Stella is a caretaker for her in more ways than what she's helping her experience life, you know, in in a way that she can't. Yeah, I can't off the top of my head remember the book, but I read a book in which there were twins where one brother was blind and oh. the other one described, but the gag was he made stuff up. Oh. So it was like, oh, 
this is like a wonderful ham and it was, you know, like old moldy roast beef or whatever. So mm-hmm. they played that situation a little bit more humorously, but definitely in this, yeah, you get the same thing. And to me, I was fairly early on, I understood that Dot had blindness, but it took longer for me to understand that it was more like legal blindness. Right. Right. And, and so spoiler, right? But that kind of evolves throughout the film. And I think that actually is a nice touch because you don't see the the legally blind portrayed. And to me, that felt, in some sense, it made it more grounded Mm -hmm. because then it wasn't really about, I don't know, for some reason, it made it not about the blindness. She wasn't like a blind person. She was a person who had trouble seeing, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm Mm-hmm. And in press for the film, Brenda Fricker said that she loved the screenplay. She was so moved by it and thought it was a beautiful love story. And so she felt like she couldn't say it. And at the end of this month, we're going to have a bonus episode where we're having a friend of ours, actually a fan of the show. Super fan RJ. Super fan RJ is going to come because we just wanted to have a very responsible conversation about these films. And us being two straight people, we thought, let's get you know, somebody from the community to comment on. We want to talk about the writing and the acting and the casting, because oftentimes when we're talking about race and, you know, like Quiet Place, they were praised because the daughter is hard of hearing also. And so I want to talk about in that episode, and we will, these are two, to the best of my knowledge, two straight women playing gay. And you know, I thought she said it was a beautiful love story. She couldn't say no to it. And so it's just something to talk about when we have that episode. Yeah. And this is kind of interesting, I think, from casting, because people often get upset if you cast the wrong race for a role. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is perhaps a bit different because our definition of race, even though genetically there's almost no difference, but it's based on visual appearance and film captures visual appearance very well. So that's a thing. Yeah. You can look at Tom Hanks and say, that's not an Asian person. Correct. However, can you look at Brenda Fricker and say, oh, she is uh, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, whatever. Right. No, you really can't. The same as you couldn't pick out, for example, her religion or political affiliation just by looking. Looking, yeah. So, but then I think it is interesting to see, given that, how does it land with somebody who is closer to the issue? Right. And so I, I think Superfan RJ is obviously a fan of the podcast, but also of film. And it'd be interesting to kind of get a different perspective on this because I felt like the relationship in this film was realistic and touching and those things. So I'm just curious to see what other people think. I am too. I am too. So as we were watching this, there were a few scenes that I was like, I don't think that would happen. And, and I was curious as to the writer. And I've done a lot of research on these films and all of the writer directors of the four films that we're talking about, they are in the LGBTQ community. So that was interesting then to look at some of these scenes because there there was a scene where she is kind of, she, Olympia Dukakis, Stella goes to a gas station and she purchases a sex toy and then comes home and like playfully kind of tickles her. And it's almost like, taking advantage of her not being able to see it. Right. And so she can only feel it. And I thought, really? I mean, okay, Dot's an older woman, but I don't think this is her first experience with a vibrator. And so I was just like, I, it felt, it, it didn't ring true. So I'm... S- right. And then in retrospect, as you mentioned that, thinking back, now that I know that she's legally blind, but she still can see light and dark in some shapes, uh-huh. does that make sense? And I'll be honest that... If I didn't know that the director was part of that community, I uh-huh. would think it was written by a straight guy who it, thought dildo humor was funny. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's how it played off to me. And yeah. so, well, now we've got to get a lesbian to weigh in on the topic. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and a blind one if we can find her. Right. <laughs> so, and on directing Olympia Dukakis, I thought this little tidbit was fun. The director said she she's very foul mouthed. It's very blue. If you do not like blue language then maybe skip cloudburst but but i didn't find it objectionable she said she did express hesitancy to say all of the course language that i wrote meaning that this is from the director's point of view he said but you know she's a professional and she said that the script is her bible and the director is her god and so she would do it 
But actually, I only wrote about half of the course language <laughs> in the script. And once given permission to curse on film, he couldn't stop her. And I enjoyed that little tidbit of trivia. Yeah, there's a, a great line in there where Stella is in a car with a fairly conservative Canadian fella. Mm hmm. And she keeps using the C word that is not not allowed in the U.S., <laughs> but more very pop- common yeah. in Britain. Yeah. He complains about it. She says, what? Are you crazy? That word is for punctuation, which <laughs> I think perfectly describes the character of Stella. She's foul-mouthed in the kind of way that at least I've encountered over, over my life. There are those people that do use those words almost as punctuation, right? They're just mm-hmm. freely strewn about. So I thought it was kind of a fun interaction between that character and Stella playing a little bit with gender stereotypes because the Mm -hmm. man is uncomfortable with the coarse language and the woman is swearing up a storm. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a fun little scene. So in the scene that we mentioned earlier with the sunset, it's obviously supposed to be what is called golden hour in movie. Was it just movie making or is it any like photography? Photography knows it too. Yeah. Yeah. And it's basically, is it an hour before dusk? Yeah. Yeah. It's the hour before sundown. And so the sun, because of where it is in the horizon, it just gives off this beautiful golden glow. And there's actually a famous movie. I should look it up. I'll put it in the show notes. It has Richard Gere in it. And the director wanted that light so bad (laughs) that that's the only time they filmed. And it took them like 30 days. That seems low, but it was insane. I can't even imagine. And they had to be so precise and All of the cast and crew had to just be spot on because they couldn't afford to take to do a bunch of takes because they had only this like tiny window of like an hour and a half. Yeah, I just can't. And it was a film. It's a period piece. And it's set like when the set settlers were coming west. And so you figure they had to cart everybody out there for an hour and a half and then cart everybody back to wherever base camp was. I just which reminds me of. What I'd heard about the production of Waterworld, where right. the floating city had to be towed back in to port at the end of every day and then towed back out. Wow. Right. The producers of those movies should get an Oscar just for dealing with the logistics <laughs> yeah. of all of that. Don't you think that like the, the line producer got a bunch of gray hair and, and it had a stroke or yeah, something by the deserve... end of that? It's amazing the stress that must have been. I mean, forget like... Bette Midler and Stevie Wonder for the Kennedy Center <laughs> Honors. Like, it should be these line producers that deal with all this, you know. Okay. Uh, I want I, a spider in the third act. Now I see this funny 30-minute little short on YouTube <laughs> of these line producers standing in line at, at, at Starbucks. And then we come running up and like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that you did Waterworld. You are so amazing. <laughs> Let's buy you a cup of coffee. Yeah, exactly. And the guy's like, well, well, thank you. It's good that someone appreciated it. Right, right. Yeah. So anyway, we get back to this golden hour shot. It's at two minutes. Oh, maybe. It would, oh, yeah, it was at two minutes, 57 seconds. So it was very early in the film. And there was another one at the end that I'm sure was shot at the same time. Yeah. And I just I this is one of our pauses because, you know, I've worked with a handful of directors that will say, oh, we'll fix it in post. And they just kind of hand wave away kind of getting something right. And to me, this was an example of you should have waited till golden hour and just shot this one right. in real life because I don't think that was golden hour. It looks fake. Oh, I am positive. It's not. And if uh, you recall, at another point during the film, I said, oh, this is when they shot that other one and they just put yellow tint on it in post. And the thing is, it, it doesn't it doesn't, it doesn't look right. It doesn't ring true. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's because literally it looks like he just took a yellow marker and scribbled over the entire screen and there's something that just doesn't look quite right. Mm -hmm. And that is, I I agree with you, that was key to the, kind of to that dialogue. It's worth waiting for. Now, to be fair to the production, and they maybe didn't have a huge budget, it's possible they did shoot it during golden hour and it was unusable for some reason. And so they had to do it as a pickup. Look how nice you are. Well, I'm just thinking (laughs) as a director. Yeah. I'm familiar with like, ugh. It's possible that yeah. that wasn't their first choice. That was their only choice. Yeah, no, I, those things happen. And so you just have to do what you can. But right. even I think it's just good for us, even as indie filmmakers, which this one, I think almost could probably fall in that indie category. We'll oh, yeah, go over the like numbers it. later. But I mean, it does have two pretty big stars. It's based on a play that had been done earlier. But of the those are the only kind of two notable 
stars in the film, so I believe this would probably fall on that indie budget. I just think that, you know, do what you can to get it as close to it. Like, I'm Absolutely. always the one that if a door is going to close, let's not get a door sound effect. Let's record the door closing because you're not ever going to get anything that sounds as authentic as the actual door in the film, in the room, with the people in it. I it's just... absolutely 100% agree with you. And I just want this noted. So <laughs> in my film, if I need a scream and I shove the actor down, that's why. It's just for realism. So we already discussed the vibrator scene. So these two end up going on the lamb. And I had a fun little observation I guess I think it was fun. <laughs> He's saying all points uh. bulletin has been put out. And I paused again and I said, how many points are there? <laughs> right. Well, all points. So I actually have no idea of the etymology of that. <laughs> right. So when I stopped and thought about it, I thought, well, is that a compass thing? Like, I, I vaguely remember like oh. on, in, 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 in ocean going, like there's like the, the compass points. I feel like that's a and so a it's thing I'd like heard. a 360 degree. And that's what it's supposed to be. Or is it like, you know, the points on the map? Like, oh, oh points bulletin. What a strange phrase. Like, I have no idea where it came from. But APB, that was a big deal when we were kids. There's yeah. lots of APBs going yeah. out. Yeah. So let's see. I should have mentioned this when you were talking about Stella's vulgarity. Because not only does she use the language, she ta- she speaks openly of her enjoyment of female parts. Yes. And what she would do with them. In particular, she calls out a famous lesbian singer for some attention, which I think if I'm Katie Lang, am I flattered or creeped out by that <laughs> by line of dialogue? The, yeah, Katie Lang is brought up more than once yeah, in yeah. this film. And I was just like, wow, she kind of even made me uncomfortable. <laughs> and I don't consider myself very prudish, but I was just like, whoa, she's going for it. So. Maybe that's a reference that the director was talking about how she she kind of went. Yeah, she went. She went past. there. Yeah. Let's say. Yeah, uh, she went like fully into it. I admire <laughs> that commitment to the character. I did notice you were talking about her being not legally blind. The scene. Well, first of all, what I was going to say is they split up the party, which Mike has a really good philosophy in life. Never split the party. Learned that from D and D. Never split the party. Never split the party. So it made us a little bit nervous because at one point. They have to split up and Stella ends up walking alongside of the road while the gentleman, I believe. Prentice is his name. Prentice, yes. While Prentice takes Dot into town and then he has to leave Dot in town, which, you know, you leave in a blind woman in just a foreign town. I don't believe, I don't know if she had like a wallet or. or No. This was, nobody had a cell phone, I don't believe, even though this could have been modern day. Yeah. Oh, it definitely was contemporary. No one had a cell phone. He left her in a rocking chair, if that helps. <laughs> in front of like a, an antique store. Yeah. So so when they came back and Stella Dot's got walking towards the car because like the window's down and they're like, you know, come here. Did you notice Stella tapping on the door? She was kind of almost like, and I've seen this in different other documentaries, almost a form of like echolocation or just following the sound. That's how Dot could find her and know where to walk to. Right. I call that indexing, and I asked a usability engineer, and if there is a well-known term for it, I don't remember what that is, but I call that indexing, where you, you reach out to kind of, you know, find find your way in the environment around you. And obviously, people who are sighted tend to do it more when it's like dark, but that, that makes some sense. One thing that I thought was really interesting, a little bit later, after they've gotten into Canada, right, mm-hmm. Prentice does like a dance by the side of the road. Right. And at first it was out of focus. And I'm like, oh, what's the the director doing? Like I was, I had a moment where I was confused. Then I realized, oh no, he's showing us what Dot sees, how she sees that dance because of her legal blindness. Oh, wow. I didn't pick that. And it took me a bit, but that was, I thought that was clever. Oh, and then there's a moment at the end of act two where Stella, she, she doesn't, she's so afraid of separating them as well as them half, I think losing their independence. I think this is a, a classic tale of, you know, people of, of that generation, you know, they've taken the care of themselves their entire lives. And then it's when somebody else is stepping in and, and questioning their ability. And at the en- end of act two, she kind of, kind of claims defeat in a way. And she just says, I can't do it. Like she gets scared because there was a moment right. where she needed to protect Dot and she wasn't able to. And she realizes that, 
she may have to face the reality that she can't take care of her and Dot anymore. It's well, very... the granddaughter, Molly, mm-hmm. tries to take advantage of Dot. Mm-hmm. So I think that, to me, explains some of Stella's paranoia. Because, uh, again, as women of that era, you didn't have any legal recourse right. if you're the person who should be your spouse, who is not legally, their their granddaughter could come swoop in and take everything and make these decisions right. for, for someone that you care about and that you know better than the granddaughter. And that's kind of what happens in the documentary. So I bet the play was written before marriage was legal co- in the United States, because in the... In this film, they're headed up to Canada where gay marriage is legal. And so they want to go up there so that they can be married so that people can't break them up, meaning the granddaughter. So that's the impetus of them going on a road trip, which makes for a great movie. Yes. I like what the granddaughter had to say. I believe it was near the end or close to it. And she says, you guys aren't exactly Ellen and Portia. (laughs) (laughs) I thought that was a good line. That is a good line. I did write down that the dialogue seemed confusing at times. I think we were both kind of like, wait, what's going on? Right. A couple times. I, I think by the end of the film, we understood it. Yeah. So it was just kind of, it was a slow burn maybe. Yep. I loved, we, this, I don't know if we actually paused or we just made a comment, but there's a point about two thirds in and Prentice is doing hands up. Stella has parked the truck on the dock and her and Dot are talking. And in the background, Prentice is doing handstands and he's kind of like walking around, very much reminding me for anybody who's listening that went to grade school with me, we used to have handstand competitions. And let's see, Marty Michelson, Bodum Yum, and I can't remember, there was the Holloway twins were pretty good at it too. They would go like three minutes and they would walk around like Prentice was doing on their hands. It's impressive when an adult can do it. Because of the physics, right? When a 40-pound six-year-old does it, it's neat, but it's not the same as, as, you know, an adult male. And I think you were right that this may not have been in the original script. And once the director found out that the actor could do a handstand, he's like, we got to put that in the film. I guarantee you in between takes, the actor did it. And people were impressed that he was able to do it. And he was like, oh, we got to put that in the movie. I just realized, though, the poor actor... Because he had to do it on like a wooden dock that often has like shards of wood. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe some PA was out there with a block of of sandpaper. (laughs) Sandpaper. Yeah, get him the hookup. (laughs) My classmates got to do it in the gym. (laughs) Right, right. Well, you know, but he's a paid actor. Yeah. Their commitment is legendary. So one thing that we noticed under the costumes category is the border officer had quite the <laughs> oversized bulletproof vest. And once again, this probably calls to an indie film where it was either somebody borrowed somebody's bulletproof vest. <laughs> right. Or they found like a really cheap one online or maybe yeah, like one oh, just, size fits all. Yeah. <laughs> it just looked, <laughs> it was cause for comedy right, right there. <laughs> so this isn't costuming, but I, I, I talk about it in the same category, hair and makeup. Uh huh. Really great credit to the makeup artist for the bruises on Dot's arm. Uh huh. Those look realistic bruises. So I hope it was that, and, and it wasn't Method where the director you know jabbed her a bunch <laughs> of times. Yeah. yeah, let's. I'm pretty sure it was. Uh, it was makeup. I did note that we got some Katie Lang songs, so we got that approved. I enjoyed the fiddle music, and I'm listening to music more because I tend to not use it as much in my films, but because it feels too manipulative and a little saccharine or a little oh yeah, I can exploitive, see what you... but I, I hear it and it works. So I've got to learn so, how to embrace it. This is like when I was reading someone, an article said, don't use a montage because it comes across <laughs> as cliched and corny. And I think as all of you know, I'm a big fan of the montage and I don't think it always comes across as corny, but I see where you're going with the music, right? We kind of make a joke about that, like, oh, sad oboe music now, yeah. or, oh, the strings are going to swell, you know? So there is that line, right, where you could go too far and it does become kind of a caricature. Right, right. Was there any head trauma in this film? I have no note of head trauma. Dot did fall out of the bed when they were having the back massager fight, <laughs> um, but she didn't hit her head. She just sprained her wrist. Right. And then... I believe we got a smoochie. Smoochie, smoochie, smoochie. 
Uh, I have a couple of smooches. The first one is at 1 minute 51, Stella comes home with a tequila and she mm -hmm. gives Dot a kiss that is, it's not immediately obvious that it's romantic. It's just a peck. And, you know, depending on different cultures, some people might, you know, do that peck. Right. Then Stella and Dot kiss in the rainstorm in Nova Scotia oh. at 4539. And then at the end, Stella and Dot during the marriage in the pickup at 1 hour 25 and 19 seconds. Oh, sweet. And this whole movie was almost a road movie, so we've got to have a driving review. Oh, yeah. Well, a couple of things. So first of all... That pickup was almost like a set, pretty much. Yeah, I was going to say, I may have talked about this before, but I'll talk about it a little bit more. Kind of like with costumes, um, done well, the vehicle choice communicates something about the character. So the red Ford Ranger pickup... If you're paying close attention, it looks like it's an at-home paint job because on the gate of the pickup, the Ford lettering is the same red color as is the bumper. And so what that tells us is that they don't have a lot of money and that Stella is rough and ready. Mm -hmm. So if we didn't know already that she was perhaps the kind of woman that liked comfortable shoes, mm -hmm. that we get that. It, it, it communicates who she is. And then the granddaughter, Molly, drives a silver Toyota Corolla which is about the most bland vanilla vehicle you can get, showing that she is so white bread, so vanilla, that it sets up that she's going to have problems with the couple. Now, I will say, folks, do not drive a motor vehicle after consuming a full bottle of tequila. I don't believe Stella should be doing that. And I will also mention that if you're in a vehicle and you're being chased by an angry naked man, <laughs> don't just drive in a circle drive faster away from the angry <laughs> naked man. That's that's my, my free advice. It did for make for a listeners. funny scene. It did. There is a fair amount of twig and berries in this film. Yes. Yes. For, for a movie about two lesbians, you're right. absolutely correct. And it's so funny because I thought it would be Prentice, but it was not. I thought it would be too, mm -hmm. especially because he comes across when they first meet him as a bit of a hustler. Mm -hmm. But it was not. It turns out that person is a stuntman. And I believe that the scene where he's chasing them and then jumps onto the truck yeah. is why they had a stuntman do it. Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we do the numbers? Let's go to the numbers. Okay. Cloudburst, like I said, came out in 2011. It is free right now on Amazon Prime. So you guys can check it out if you subscribe to Amazon Prime. It has an IMDb score of 7 out of 10, 7.1 to be exact, out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes has it at 100%. So 100% of critics good job. said this film was super good. And audiences, I would say, tended to agree at 76%. Let's see. It was an hour and 33 minutes. It's unrated. It's tagged as a adventure comedy drama romance. So a little bit of everything. The studio is the Sydney Kimmel Entertainment. I have no budget information or the gross, I guess, I don't know if it went straight to Amazon, but that definitely puts it in that indie category because if I can't find it, it means that they kind of weren't reporting it. So I think Tom Fitzgerald probably just got some friends together who maybe gave him <laughs> enough money and maybe he knew Olympia and Brenda. I, I don't know. I couldn't find out that information. The filming locations are all around Nova Scotia, Canada, Halifax, Bloomington, Grand Prix, Londonburg. Port and Lower Prospect, Nova Scotia. It won 29 film festivals. So there were so many, I couldn't even list them all. But if you go to IMDb, you can look that up. So it did quite well. People enjoyed this film. And I would say I did too. It was kind of, it was fun. It was a fun film. Fair warning, there are some feels at the end. There are, yeah, some pretty deep feels. So you said that you had a parting last shot that you would like to share. So I've made my theory fairly well known on this podcast that the opening line can establish what we're here to talk about. And in some cases, there is a good parting shot, which is the final line actually bears on the, the question as well. And in this case, Stella says, best bleep day of my life. And I think that kind of tells us, as the viewer helps us deal with the feels at the end of the film. Because right. it's the type of day that one would say it's the worst day of their life. Right. And and she says to hold on to the good days to Prentice. And this was the best bleeping day of her life. Yeah. So. It was sweet. It was very sweet. All right, everybody. That's our first film to kick off our Pride Month. 
Join us next week when we talk about Love, Simon. It is also available on Amazon Prime. So if you have that subscription, you can watch it for free also. So enjoy, everybody. And never forget, Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. 